Hello, everyone. It's uh, Larry Kotlikoff. I'm here today with Fred Lane, uh, a very good friend who's also um, a great uh, investor and uh, voice of uh, uh, good good um, advice for how to invest your money. Uh, I'll uh, take you through uh, Fred's bio, the, the, the brief version of it, and then um, we'll uh, start hearing from Fred uh, right off. So uh, Fred um, has uh, 40 years of investment and corporate finance experience as a portfolio manager, a private equity investor, and an investment banker. So he's now, um, he's a CPA, uh, Harvard uh, uh, undergraduate, um, and then he went to, uh, got an MBA at uh, Harvard Business School. Uh, he uh, is currently a CEO and CIO of um, uh, Lane Generational. Uh, uh, he was a vice president before, before he uh, started this uh, enterprise. He was Senior Vice President of Investments at Raymond James and Associates, uh, and and served as a Vice Chairman for their investment banking group. Um, he uh, was Chairman and CEO and founder of um, uh, an investment banking firm called Lane Barry Barry and uh, Company International, and that was acquired by Raymond James in uh, 2009. And uh, prior to that, Fred was a Managing Director and Principal. Of Donaldson, Luf Lufkin, and Jenrette Securities, DLJ. And Fred uh, joined DLJ in, uh, a while back, 1976. He was instrumental in um, the LA DLJ's uh, growth in investment banking. He also served as co-head of the mergers and acquisition department of DLJ and as manage managing director of um, and senior advisor of, of Credit Suisse's first Boston uh, business uh, when uh, uh, Credit Suisse uh, acquired uh, DLJ in 2000. So in his former, all bef you know, that's a good enough career as it is, but, uh, but uh, before that, um, Fred had a, uh, a major career um, in investing uh, in uh, Staples. He was a founding investor he invested in advanced micro devices, Medtronic, Ulta Beauty, Tractor Supply, Thermo Fisher Scientific, Rex Nord, the Nara, uh, Dan Aher, Plantronics, and numerous other very successful companies. So Fred's a highly experienced uh, private equity investor. Um, and he's you know, pri personally invested in over 80 uh, private companies. Fred um, is very well known on Wall Street. He uh, appears quite often on Bloomberg uh, television, uh, I guess probably radio, and also CNBC and other media outlets. So he's a, a, a big deal uh, and we're really delighted to have him. So Fred, let me just uh, kick this off by saying, first of all, thanks so much for joining and uh, and you're appearing from uh, Florida. Uh, yes, right. And I'm in uh, Providence where it's about to snow. But uh, what's the weather like in Florida? Well, uh, since you're in Providence, it's about to snow. It's kind of mean spirited for me to comment with any degree of accuracy. It's about 80 degrees out. It's a beautiful, clear, sunny day. <laughs> cool. And we have, uh, we probably the biggest. Uh, problem we have here is we, maybe the breeze is a little too heavy. It might be 10 or 12 miles an hour. <laughs> now, you get pretty spoiled down here. No question about it. Yeah. So, um, Fred, give us give everybody uh, kind of a little bit of a background, how you got in, went from uh, getting right. your uh, degree at Harvard to getting an, an MBA, and then how you got into the whole investment business. Because I like to yeah. let young people understand how careers are actually developed. Well, you know, it's funny. I was talking to a former DLJ colleague this morning who happened to go to Harvard College 25 years after I did. And he runs a hedge fund in, the, in Los Angeles. He's a very good friend. 
And I explained to him that my background, which was very much middle class in the Boston area, um, did not position me to go to Harvard Business School directly from Harvard College. What did was the fact that when I went to Harvard, I, I had attended, I was always an athlete. I was a very good student. I went to a little teeny school in the Boston area called the Roxbury Latin School. And it was an excessively academic school, but we actually produced a number of college athletes. So when I went to college, I had, had intended and expected I would play basketball. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't really recruited by Harvard. I was recruited by Yale and Dartmouth and Princeton and some other schools, but not by Harvard, which I found quite irritating. <laughs> so uh, before I got to Harvard, I got recruited to row crew. Um, and crew at Harvard was and is a big sport. One of the, you know, we're, we're always one of the top crews in the country. And in my day, because rowing was so much less popular and more of a obscure sport, uh, you could be pretty assured if you worked really hard, you had a chance at least to make an Olympic team or a national team, which I actually did when I, when I was in college, I was on the 1970 national team and, uh, rowing at the world championship. So the reason I bring all that up is because when I went to the Harvard boathouse, which was filled with these really aggressive alpha male types who came from generally pretty affluent backgrounds, I got exposed to a world that I had not been exposed to. And I saw this wealth from investing and banking and investment banking and insurance that it was not part of my context. My dad was a first generation American who was a doctor. He went to Harvard College too, but he commuted by trolley car from Somerville. So you get the picture. So um, when I was at the boathouse, um, particularly at the end of my junior year, a number of the seniors said to me, you should really go to Harvard Business School. I think there were two. And I said, why should I do that? And they said, because you're a person, you know, your, your personality fits. That was a polite way of saying I talk too much. But in any event, uh, I did apply to Harvard Business School. And I did get in. And I've been an English major. So I went to Harvard Business School. And, oh, boy, I was absolutely convinced I was going to flunk out. Uh, there's no way I was going to make it. I was 21. The average entering, the average age of my entering classmates was 26, I believe. And I just felt like I was a little boy pretending to be knowledgeable about business. And I really wasn't. Of course, many of them weren't either. And uh, finally, that fall in about October, we got our first exam back. And my confidence went from the floor to the ceiling because I got one of the five excellence in the class. These are the seminal things I think about in terms of my life. So Harvard Business School was great for me. I really enjoyed it um, when I came out. I was 23. I wanted to stay in Boston. The economy was pretty terrible. So I went into public accounting. I figured I could learn some things about business in a real world way because it was always my objective to be the CFO of a company. That's why I said, oh, if I could just be the CFO of a good company, that'd be great. So I went into public accounting and uh, having had some really keen interest in, in investment banking. And I went to Wall Street three years later with Donaldson, Lufkin and Jenrette, which was kind of a dream come true for me because when I got there, it never felt again, like I had ever worked again. I, Cooper's and Librand, which was a great firm and we had great clients and I had a great experience there. It always felt like work and investment banking never felt like work. Not really. I was too excited by working with CEOs and CFOs on strategy and financing and mergers and acquisitions. And so I went to a firm, DLJ, which like many other firms on Wall Street at the time was not in very good shape financially. I should add that average trading volume in the New York Stock Exchange in 1976 was 10 million shares a day, 10 million shares a day, by the way. And um, and the typical Wall Street firm had maybe 150, 250, 300 people. Um, DLJ had 400. We were the first firm to go public and we were barely profitable. And we survived because we were quick on our feet and we had a, a very successful growth equity portfolio called Sprout. And we also had a very successful institutional money management business called Alliance, now known as Alliance Bernstein. And uh, so I got exposed to, I love your cat. Uh, I got hey, exposed. Hey, I, hang I, on just I, a half second. I'm going to ask. I got exposed, Larry, to very entrepreneurial people. Yeah. And we were encouraged at the oh, time. 
That's a beautiful cat, by the way, Larry. He wants to go outside, so hang on a half a Sure, second. sure. I will hang on patiently while you put your cat outside. I'm a dog guy. I've got two dog dogs, but I, I love cats equally. Yeah. Um, so, so DLJ, I got exposed to and had the opportunity to invest in some private companies. And once you see that and you see the leverage in doing that, it gets pretty exciting. Now, I should add, by the way, there was very little capital around um, in 1976. And in my view, what has what fed the wealth effect that we're all still enjoying was a combination of things. It was first, first and foremost, and you as an economist, Larry, know that because you and I are part of the same age cohort. We know that the baby boomers came into the workplace and that was the largest bubble of people to ever go into the workplace. And that created obviously a tremendous uplift in the economy. In addition, the federal government was very concerned about retirement savings. And so they instituted what became, what started off as individual retirement accounts. And then they basically went to defined, they also liberalized rules around defined contribution plans. We know those as 401ks today. And that combination, and that, so that was people coming to the workforce. They were young, they were making money, they were putting money away because they were basically encouraged to do so. And it was pretty much common sense to do it because you got a tax deduction, you got to have your, your savings multiply, um, you know, tax free. If you want to understand more about that, you should read Larry's most recent book, which is a terrific book, by the way. A lot of common sense in there, a lot of common sense. Even for a guy like me, by the way, who thinks I know everything, but I don't. Uh, very good book. Uh, highly recommend it. And, uh, but the last factor, of course, um, in my view, at least, was we had some reduction in tax rates. Now, remember, the, the marginal tax rate in the 60s was as high as 90%. By 1981 or 1980, it was 70%. It come down some. And Reagan reduced it to from 70 to 50 in 1981 was much criticized. And then in 1986, the marginal tax rate went from 50 to 28. Now with that, there were a lot of uh, deductions that were taken away. But for most of us, and I certainly put myself in this space, it was, it was great because basically we had the ability to keep more of what we were making and invest it as we saw fit. And I think that... Uh, you know, I have a libertarian leaning. I'll be the first one to admit. And so I think the question you have to always ask yourself about taxes is who's going to do a better job allocating capital, the public sector or the private sector? And you, you can make your own judgments on that. But in any event, the combination of those factors, basically, that was created a, a, this flow of funds into public markets. And so the stock market, you know, went up a lot. Uh, an outgrowth of that, of course, was private equity investing. A lot of money went into private equity investing. The junk bond industry was an out, was basically an offshoot of all that capital because it was basically high yield debt with some of the risk of equities. And you put that all together and, and basically Wall Street was a great place to be. You didn't have to be the brightest bulb to, to thrive when there was so much money, so much capital coming into the industry. So Fred... And, and you, I was the beneficiary of that. No question about it. You were one of the br brightest bulbs. Uh, so, well, during this period, you're doing a lot of private equity investing, mm -hmm. and you've done that continually thereafter, right. really, even though you've had some other, you know, these other positions. I think it'd be interesting for um, uh, people listening and, and watching to know how you consider a company when you know you have all these op all these companies that you might invest in. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it that you look for as a seasoned private investor, uh, private equity investor? What, what are the five or 10 things that you kind of uh, check off before you plunge in? Well, I think number one is the quality of the leader, the quality of the CEO. What is his background? So I was a founding investor at Staples. I had known Tom Stenberg in college. I had known him in business school. Didn't know him very well in college. He claims otherwise. I don't think we knew each other very much, but we I guess we did. He was an extraordinarily bright guy. He's he unfortunately he died of cancer several years ago. 
when he founded Staples, he brought me the business plan, which has been put together by a different firm uh, in Boston for him. And he was partnered with a fellow named Leo Kahn, who was the founder of Purity Supreme Supermarkets in Heartland. And Leo was a great guy. The combination of Leo and Tom was powerful because they both came out of the supermarket industry. And Staples looked at this industry, this office supplies industry, the so-called stationers industry, and said, this is a ridiculous industry. This is a distribution business with 40 to 50% gross margins. That's too much. We should build large stores. We should cut the prices and we can make a lot of money doing it. Turns out it was a fairly capital intensive business, but um, I did invest in the first round and then the third round. And uh, it ended up you know, being about 90 to hundred times of my money. But more importantly, but more it was a better public company, interestingly enough, than private company. So one of the things that I have found to be true is when you have a great company with great management and they continue to be able to achieve, um, uh, you know, a very dominant position and they can defend that position, it tends to be a pretty good public company even after it's been public. A lot of say, oh, you know, once it's public, the gains aren't there. That is not true. I took public tractor supply in the mid 90s and it had a market cap of about 240 million dollars and today its market cap is i haven't checked recently i'm guessing it's about 16 or 18 billion i can say honestly that joe scarlett who's retired and ran the business for about 35 years it's one of the greatest ceos i've ever met he's an upbeat power he's a just a, he loves his people they love him he's demanding he's a great coach he's a great mentor it's, it was a great public company. Alta Cosmetics. Okay, there's a, here's another one. Uh, we did public, I did all public offerings for Alta. It was actually financed by a good friend of mine in Los Angeles, a former DLJ colleague. And it was, uh, it was a very tough business. And of course, Alta today is the gorilla in the retailing of cosmetics. They're basically Sephora on steroids. They have more stores. They typically appeal to a somewhat lower price point and a younger demographic. They have a terrific uh, online business. They have a terrific loyalty business. But Mary Dillon, who ran that business, uh, it was brilliant in building the business. Having said that, that company wasn't particularly successful for eight to 10 years. So having a great management stick, by, stick to their plan and make it work, sometimes it works. Sometimes it works extremely well. There are other times, you know, I was an investor in 7up, which we bought out of Philip Morris. Uh, 7up was in it, was very undervalued, very poorly run. And it, we merged it with Dr. Pepper into one entity. And then happily, uh, the Prudential Insurance Company decided they wanted to buy out DLJ's interest. So we made about 18 times in our money in about, uh, yeah, about 18 times in our money in uh in about 20 months so that was just dumb luck the the truth is or, or maybe i should say over exuberance on the part of an institutional investor but what was uh because everything that could go right did go right and then subsequently everything that could go wrong did go wrong you know we introduced two new products they were both very successful but um the soft drink industry is a tough industry the the growth in soft drinks is is flat to down even then it was flat to them. And it's all about shelf space. And when you're competing against Pepsi-Cola and Coca-Cola, you know, you're, you're you're in a difficult spot because you may have the 7-Up brand, which is a, you know, a lemon lime drink, but Coca-Cola has Sprite. And I know Pepsi has an, Pepsi has an equivalent drink. I can't remember what it is, but the point is choosing, choosing the right industry with the right management matters. So let me ask you on this, uh, so yeah, the right industry with the right management, but so it must also be the right business plan. The, yes. You know, on uh, Seven Up, you probably saw these issues with the, the competition going in, but you went in anyway, right? So what? Well, we what bought it. Mean? We bought it. We bought it through Dr. Pepper. So I was representing a different buyer at the time. Yeah. I was actually working with a different buyer, and we bid two hundred ten million for it, and it was bought for two hundred sixty million, and then that was from and Tommy Hicks and Bobby Haas bought it. Hicks and Haas. They came to DLJ and they said, we know you represent an underbidder. We know Fred Lane's involved. Um, get him to the table. We want your assistance. We want you guys to finance it. So I explained to my team, hey, this is, this is how I got to 210. 
how do you get to 260? Well, it turned out that Dr. Pepper, Dr. Pepper had good management and that good guy named Jim Turner and that good management could be utilized to run Dr. Pepper, excuse me, 7-Up. Yeah, yeah. So basically we took out about, Dr. Pepper took out 20 million of costs and 7-Up had a deal to pay Dr. Pepper essentially 10 million a year for those costs. So a $10 million cost savings capitalized at five or six times is the difference between 210 million and 260 million. So that's how I got comfortable with it. And then, and then, as I said, everything that could go right, they introduced Dr. Uh, Cherry, Dr. Pepper, excuse me, <laughs> Cherry 7-Up and Diet Cherry 7-Up, and they were tremendously successful. And then they introduced 7-Up Gold, which was supposed to be the ginger ale product and Prudential got all excited. They wanted to buy us out. We sold out and that product, 7-Up Gold flopped, but we were out by then. And, uh, you know, it's, it, and of course now it's owned by, uh, I think Cadbury Schweppes, Cadbury owns it, but it's a tough, it's a tough space. I mean, I, I, I love businesses where you have very strong market share. Uh, you know, I have little rules. Okay. I, and this is true in public markets as well as private markets. Um, if it doesn't have a gross margin of at least 30% gross margin, cost of goods sold as a function of sales, if it doesn't have, make at least 30% gross margin, it's probably a fairly undifferentiated commodity type product. And ideally, it should have an operating margin of at least 15%, if not 20%, operating margin being profits before interest and depreciation and taxes, you know, EBITDA, we call it. I, mean, I, I like those kind of metrics. I like those kind of returns. But you also have to look at those returns, net of capital expenditures. So, you know, we had a client at DLJ, Advanced Micro Devices, run by one of the most colorful and charismatic CEOs I've ever met, Jerry Sanders. But the truth is that AMD was, at the time, it's not true today, was a second source supplier to Intel. And as a second source supplier to Intel, they weren't able to dictate price. And 20 years after its founding, AMD still didn't have any retained earnings. Now think about that. You've been in business for 20 years. You have no retained earnings. Oh. And, and part of the reason for that is because the semiconductor industry, at the time at least, was extremely capital intensive. So AMD was playing the same war um, in the same battle as Intel building out wafer fab facilities, which now cost $10 billion. In my day, they cost $500 million or a billion. That's a big, big number. And so today the industry has changed. And AMD, by the way, has spun off its, its, uh, its foundry business. It's now known as Global Foundries. But Jerry was an incredibly charismatic guy, but he, he, he didn't have, he really never built the engineering capability to be able to uh, leapfrog over, over Intel. And I say that as no criticism of Jerry and his team. Intel was so powerful for so long and now we see Intel struggling. You know, it, in, in many ways, it's reminiscent of the problems IBM has had. IBM was so dominant for so long. And it's kind of an also ran because too often dominant companies aren't willing to change and frankly cannibalize their existing business by, by going, you know, basically saying the world's changing. We're going to have to take capital and take it out of our great profitable business and invest in the future. That's hard to do. It's really hard to do because we all, you know, we all tend to, we love the, the devil we know, that's the business we know, and the uncertainty of building another business that might essentially eliminate your your historical legacy business is, is difficult. So on that score, I mean, if you look at the Fortune 500 today versus where the Fortune 500, let's say uh, 30 years ago, uh, lots of turnover, right? And yeah, I, I don't know the actual, it's funny. I, I if you look at the, even the Dow, it, it, you, it, Larry, you make a great point, you know, um, so often companies go through, go through periods of great success. Then their industry goes out of favor. I want to talk about the oil and gas industry shortly, because it's a great example of this, but you know, you and I have been in the new England area and the New York area for 30, 40 years. And in Boston, we had Prime Computer, we had Apollo, we had Digital Equipment, which at what point, at one point, was one of the most successful companies in the world. 
they're all gone. They're all, they've all been acquired. They've all been gobbled up um, because they were, they were, and those, those three companies were all in the mini computer business. And, and what's happened, of course, is that semiconductor power has taken the mini computer and basically reduced it to, you know, now we have small servers that have 10 times or hundred times the capacity of those mini computers. I mean, it's laughable. My iPhone has probably 200 times the processing power of the digital image processing companies that I sold, one to 3M, one to Gould. I sold these companies in the late eighties and they, they were selling boxes for 10, 20, $30,000 to NASA and various medical applications. And the processing power in our in our iPhones is is so or in our Androids is so much greater, and it's a great example of of how quickly technology changes. It's just one of the reasons that in our investing strategy at Lane Generation, our Helix strategy, we're very much focused, primarily focused, in fact, on technology and growth companies. Be, be it growth, be it technology in healthcare or technology in industrial applications or technology as we know it today, software and consumer technology as well. So does this, uh, by the way, um, people can invest with you through Fidelity, right? Uh, well, not not so easily. Uh, Fidelity is our platform. They're our custodian. You, you can find us on Fidelity's platform, but not very easily through an existing RIA. If you have an existing registered investment advisor with whom you work, they can they probably won't want to but they can send you to send you to us to manage part of the money but if you look up lane generational or even fred lane you'll find lane generational website and you can reach out to me directly and we're happy to do that and i might add i just have to put in this plug because i'm very proud of this um we charge a flat one percent fee and uh most of the wealth managers out there who manage money for clients are charging three quarters of a percent or a percent and then they're buying products like ours or ETFs that have additional fees. So all in, we believe our fees are anywhere from 20 to 40% lower than what most uh, people who have their money managed by an investment advisor are managing, which might lead you to question my sanity. Why would I price our products so low? And, and frankly, when I got into the business, I didn't know any better. And I thought fees are likely to come down. And so we're very comfortable with this fee structure I don't like it. I wish we could charge more, but it's fine. And, uh, and ultimately, providing value is why I did this. I didn't really do it because, and this is an additional career for me, right? I mean, I'm, and I intend to do this for the next 20 years. Larry and I joke about, are we ever going to retire? And I think uh, our commitment to good health and a full life suggests we're not going to do that. We're going to retire a year after we die, right? Right, exactly. Exactly. So, so the, um, so if you're saying, you know, you know, if you think about digital um, and these other uh, companies or General Electric, I mean, uh, so does this mean that the investors should be kind of thinking about the company's prospects over the next uh, five years and not not really count on it uh, delivering beyond that? And then kind of think I about it out because, I mean, is there some kind of law of, um, of uh business here that uh, says that once you've got like a good product and a good idea that it's going to work for a while, but the creative, you know, Schumpeter's sh uh, uh, theory of creative destruction is going to apply and you're going to be basically, you know, out of business after 10 years. Well, you're not going to be out of business, but, um, but one of the things that I think investors do need to focus on is, is the, is the competitive position and they have to monitor that and follow that. So, you know, we, we do very deep research in each of the holdings we have, and we, we only have at any point in time, perhaps 20 or 22 holdings. So we follow their quarterly reports. We talk to management and directors, whatever we can. We go to conferences. We buy third-party research from a number of investment banking firms, including Credit Suisse and, uh, and Raymond James. Uh, we, we participate, we are subscribers to some expert knowledge networks, Tegas being one, T-E-G-U-S. Gerson Lehman is one people may be familiar with, but basically these are where executives who have left a company 
and are no longer a subject to non-disclosure agreements can talk about their experience at the company and their perspectives. So I believe the best way to understand what's happening in a company is uh, the best way is not to talk to management. We do talk to managements, of course, and, and research analysts from Wall Street are okay, but I love to talk to customers and competitors and suppliers because they really have the best handle on what's what the dynamic is. Um, but your question really was, can you buy a stock and hold it forever? And the answer is no, you can't. Um, when we buy into a company, we believe that it has multiple years of compounding, but uh, things happen. Um, I give you a great example. We were a long-term holder of Adobe. We made a lot of money in Adobe. And, uh, but we were worried about their growth rates and worried about their valuation relative to their growth, growth rates. As I think you know, uh, Larry, we also own ServiceNow. And we looked at the two and we said, gee, of those two companies, ServiceNow is much better positioned and doesn't sell at a substantially higher price than Adobe. And we got a little worried about Adobe. We started taking money off the table. And finally, uh, Adobe announced recently an acquisition of a company called Figma. And Figma, uh, it was agreed, was so important to Adobe because it allowed for collaboration in terms of use of these marketing tools and, and design tools. Adobe is, is big on uh, the tools are very much used for publishing and you know, everything we do on the internet, everything we post, you know, frequently it's dependent on Adobe tools. So Figma was seen as a very important acquisition. Uh, when it was announced, uh, Adobe basically kind of went sideways, Figma went up and Adobe, to our surprise a little bit, actually increased in value. There were, there was a lot of talk about there was probably going to be an FTC investigation that they might prevent the deal from going through. We were very concerned. We sold our position. And uh, and guess what? The FTC is going to do a review, and my guess is it doesn't get approved. Now, the bad news isn't, ju isn't just that, but now Adobe has kind of admitted to the world, we really needed the uh, we really needed this Figma acquisition. And now they're being told they can't make it. So, you know, uh, I will say this: very few companies grow to the sky. And then you can Somebody say that. Sorry, say that again. Very, uh, like trees, most companies don't grow to the sky. Right. And so as much as I'd like to tell you that every position we take, and there are some where I would tell you it's, this isn't the case, but we're not traders. We're long-term investors. So we always say that the best, holding the best holding period is forever, but that's not really ever the case. But, you know, I'll give you, but you can also have great companies where the valuation just gets to be, in our view, too high relative to other opportunities out there. Now, let me say that one of our clients at DLJ was Costco. We financed them privately. They have been a very successful public company. I love the company. The vice chairman and CFO is one of my best friends. I hired him coming out of college. I advised him to go to business school. I, I, he's a wonderful human being, Richard Galanti. He's the face of the company to Wall Street. Um, and, you know, we, we invested at it, in, in it and doubled our money and more than doubled our money. And we don't own it anymore. Now, why don't we own it? Because we thought it just got too expensive. We just thought it got a little too expensive. And I, I, don't, I didn't pick up the phone and call Richard and say, what do you think? Is the stock too expensive? But, you know, you, you, at some point you have to look at, at the company, is it a great company? But it may be a great company at not a great valuation. So Fred, if you're a, let's say middle-class investor, uh, you're not, you're a doctor, a lawyer, or whatever, a school teacher, um, and somebody's listening to you, uh, let's say, you know, the, the, these people would want to uh, invest in particular companies in the same manner that you are, you have all kinds of access uh, and these information sources that a typical investor would not have. So you would not be advised. So you can, so this is the advantage of a private equity uh, company, if you like, uh, uh, or entrepreneur who actually has uh, uh, enough capital to really play with the, with the, uh, with whatever the other sharks, mm -hmm. as opposed to a, a small fry investor who's never going to be able to learn these kinds of things 
that you are. Is this is this the secret to your success, or is it, well, you, no, or is no. it that you have a better nose than other people like you? Well, uh, so let's differentiate between private investing, which I do through funds that I I'm very familiar and close to the people who manage the fund. My son actually has a fund. I'm, I have a big commitment to his fund, but I have an, commitments to other funds and have invested in other funds, some of which are kind of household names, Summit Partners and TA Associates and people like that. Um, I invest in other people's funds. I do that. And my access is available because I know the people who run the funds and I can make a half a million dollar commitment over five years, just not an insignificant amount of money. And I can make that commitment and I have access. But having said that, the truth is that public company investing doesn't work too badly. And I want to get back to your book and make a point here, which is, which is, and I think there are two things to think about for a person who's got $100,000 income, a $200,000 income, and they, they live modestly and they say it. The truth is that the bright, shiny object of private equity or real estate, commercial real estate, as an example, um, it's a bright, shiny object, but it's illiquid. And, and, you have to, and you have to have some expertise and you have to know how to analyze, in the case of real estate, you know, what is the location? What is the demand for warehouse space, as an example, or apartments or whatever? We've all seen what's happened with office buildings recently. So I think you have to have specialized expertise. One of the things I think you speak to in your book is, is index funds. Now, I'm an active investor, so I should hate index funds. And I should criticize index funds. Mm -hmm. And I think they've been a little overdone. But having said that, I think the average investor would be very well served to sit down uh, with a financial advisor and say, I, I just want to invest in index funds. I'm happy to basically mirror the market. Now, you're not going to get rich that way. However, you actually are going to get rich that way if you let the returns compound. So the first and the most important thing for investors to realize is don't look at your port, whatever you allocate to equities, to stocks. And by the way, given inflation, which we think will be persistent, we think investing in equities and commodities is very important because we don't think inflation is coming down. And we don't think the federal government wants inflation to come down, nor can it afford high interest rates. So that combination, in my view, drives people to wanting to own, should they, they should want to own equities. But you don't have to, if you basically put aside X amount of money and you let it grow at seven or 8% a year, well, then that, whatever you put in in year one, in year 10 or nine or eight will have doubled, depending if it's a 7% return or an 8% return and so on. We all, you know, the rule of 72s, right? Take 72, take your growth rate, it's 9%, it doubles in eight years. So um, I would say that the mistake people make is they put money in the equity markets and they use it as an ATM. They want the cash back. And typically when they want the cash back is not always, but frequently it's the wrong time. It's not always the wrong time. So if you're going to put, if you're not going to buy a house in the next two years or three years, you probably don't want money in the equity market unless you have plenty of money, you have other sources of capital anyway. But if it's, if it's, if it's, if your capital is limited, allocate only that which you can leave in the market because the time you're going to be most inclined emotionally to sell it is when the market's really down. And of course, that's the time when everybody says, but of course they don't do it. Everybody says, oh, I'm, I want to buy at the bottom, but people don't buy at the bottom. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we've had a miserable 2022 as an industry. And, um, you know, the markets, the S&P is up, I don't know, 7 8% so far this year. Our stocks are up significantly more than that, I'm glad to say. Larry, I'm glad to report that to you. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, but, you know, and, and, and a number of our holdings, companies that really had not performed well, which I hated. I mean, I, I mean, when I say hated, I'm, I'm being, I'm being very, I'm joking around here a little bit, but gosh, these stocks just aren't performing. But, you know, we have holdings that are up 40, 50, 60 percent year to date. It's you remember, we're at the end of February. It's two months. Wow. So things can happen very quickly. And so if you're not invested, you're not going to make money. Now, you're not going to lose money either. That's the good news. But you're not going to make money. So if your goal is to is to have your money grow at eight or nine or 10 percent a year or more, 
Um, and you're not going to do that probably without active management. Uh, but if you if if your goal is to grow at eight or nine percent a year or ten percent a year, you have to be invested. So I would say oh, yeah. the average investor just needs to stay invested and find someone to work with. And you know we have a minimum. We say our minimum is a million dollars. We make we don't hold people to that necessarily. It depends on facts and circumstances. And if I have someone who calls me up who's twenty five or thirty and wants to invest five hundred thousand dollars, it's like of course I want I want to have you join us as a client because I think you're going to be around for the next 30 or 40 years <laughs> and we're going to end up managing a much, a much larger amount of money. But, but I think people have to think long-term about, about their equity portfolios. So what you're, what you're uh, referencing with, uh, with respect to the, my book, Money Magic is uh, this idea of uh, upside investing, which I write about in the, in the book and which um, my company's uh, maxify.com software the premium version that people can get for $139 implements. And the idea is just for, for those who don't know about it, is you treat the money in the, let's say you're thinking about two investments. One is in inflation index bonds, uh, maybe a ladder of those bonds are yielding about one and a half percent real right now, uh, independent of the maturity uh, term structure is pretty flat. And then um the rest you put into this uh, casino called the stock market an index <laughs> fund, right, right. Uh, like uh, Vanguard VTSAX, which is the the broadest. Uh, I think Vanguard fund three basis points is the cost, and you're investing. If you invest in that fund, you're in effect getting some international diversification because a lot of U.S. companies, big companies, are investing abroad. So. Um, that's um, a very simple portfolio. Now, the whole idea of an upside investing is you treat the money that you have in the stock market and, and the money that you're going to add to the stock market as lost until it's found, until it's found again. So in other words, you say, okay, I'm, let's say 30, I'm going to, I've got some money, I'm going to add some money periodically into the stock market. And then maybe between 65 and, and 80, I'll gradually take it out and at that point convert it to inflation index bonds. So now if you think about that, you base your living standard on your um, on your uh, inflation index portfolio, bond portfolio, you never spend out of the stocks until they've been converted to safe assets. Now, as Fred was saying, the historic return on the stock market has been about nine and a half percent real. So this is a, a way to sleep at night and be and be in the market and have a very a decent upside po possibility. It's not guaranteed, but you can see in this software, we run Monte Carlo simulations. Here's your living standard floor, uh, and here's your upside to your floor, uh, starting from the point where you start withdrawing. And because you're leaving it in, you're not experience the, experiencing what Fred's referring to, which is the sequence of return risk of taking the money out right before the market goes up. And uh, then investing at the we're putting back in when the market's high and, and experiencing that extra volatility because of that. So that's a way to be in the market. And, and the interesting thing is, given how uh, high the, the how good this casino is compared to uh, Las Vegas, lots of risk. But um, but uh, the casino um, uh, is such that if you put in a lot of households, just 20% of your total assets into the uh, into this casino, you can have a very high upside. The, the median uh, floor in your old age could be uh, a living standard twice as high to right. even three times as high as uh, as you would other, as your basic floor. So that's the the trick. But let me uh, turn us, Fred, to macroeconomics because uh, you're often. I mean, this I think has been a fascinating discussion about investing uh, in companies and and what what somebody like you um, you know how you go about it. The but let's talk about uh, inflation and recession. Uh, you're often, as I said, uh, a, a guest on uh, major uh, talk shows, uh, um, national uh, media shows, and Bloomberg and CNBC and so forth. What's your view about inflation? Why do you think inflation is going to stay high given that the market thinks it's going to go down to about two and a half percent 
uh, at least in my, over five years and then beyond that. Uh, so where, where are you uh, coming from on this? Well, I'm not going to I'm not going to forecast where it'll be in five years, but but I will say this: we we have what is clear. And by the way, this is true in China and and in Europe to a much greater extent. But we have China and Europe have declining populations, declining indigenous populations. We do not. We have some population growth. We are actually growing more than our we're growing more than the replacement rate. That's helpful to our economy. But we have an aging population. And we have this structural problem with employment. We, and we have a lot of people sitting on the sidelines who aren't working, who could work. We have, I think, something like 8 million males between the age of 20 and 50 who aren't working. Now, part of that is, you know, maybe because the wife works. I don't know. Maybe they're working off uh, on the gig economy. But that's a, that's a very large number. So I think, you know, I, I think the Fed, who's talking about getting inflation back under control, is kind of playing with a squirt gun, trying to put out a fire. And I say that because our fiscal policy, our government spending is inflationary. Our policies on energy are inflationary and our policies on, on stimulus are inflationary. Look, I, I'm actually a, in favor of, of some adjustments, if not forgiveness. I'm gonna get very criticized for this by my friends <laughs> for student loans, but, we haven't, you know, basically there's been a moratorium on paying interest on student loans for about three years. And that moratorium has cost the federal government 200 to 300 billion dollars. All right. Now, the interest rates on student loans are way too high, anyway, in my opinion. They're terrible. And they're also people who fear defaulting, who went one year to some community college. It didn't fit for them. They should have never gone in the first place. I, I feel badly for these people. I think it's terrible. Yeah, forty percent of the kids who start college never finish. Exactly, it's That's and right. it's and it's and they and, and 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 college is expensive by any by any measure, and so and it's a tough and it's a tough return on investment. It's got to work. It's got to work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, way, one of my one of my uh, chapter titles is "Don't Borrow for College." I'm a and, college professor. Or that chap chapter. Uh, that's your, your book, Money Magic, is a great book. And I and I recommend it to friends. And they look at me like, well, well, Fred, you're a CPA. You're a sophisticated guy. And I said, no, just common sense. And, you know, common sense is called common because it is so rare. That's from Nordoff and Hall, Mutant in the Bony. But in any event, um, it is true that um, college is expensive. And, and, and so, but, but, you know, we have the, the, you know, we've had a lot of stimulus. And what people forget it's essentially, it's a, it's a wealth transfer. It's a wealth transfer between those who pay taxes and those who are the recipients of the stimulus. And so again, the question is, would you rather have the productive person investing that money? When I say investing, you know, I mean, I ran, I've run two firms where I'd walk in in the morning and I recognize there are 40, 50, 60 people on, who are relying on me. And then at DLJ even, which became, you know, we were, became a very big firm. But in the early days, I realized that, yeah, I'm part of the machine here that employs people. This is really great. So, you know, the private sector does do that. And, um, and it's important that we, we continue to fuel that sector. Now, having said all that, politicians generally, I'm a libertarian, here it comes, I think politicians are, are interested in votes and they're, they're not they're not motivated to think long term. And so so, you know, are they going to basically quash transfer payments? Are they going to quash? I mean, who wants to be responsible for bearing Social Security? Social Security needs major adjustments. Larry Kotlikoff here knows more about that than I'll ever know and knows the solutions to that. But if you if you think about Social Security, you think about Medicare, you think about uh, you know, all of these entitlements, they cost us a lot of money. And okay, that's, it is what it is. But having said that, I think we have to be very careful to not create inflation on the on the wage side um, by providing stimulus, because then you're taking a, somebody who's working and saying, why do I need to work? I just got stimulus or I have too much, un I, or I have unemployment benefits and after I yeah. pay to get to work and so on. Energy policy is the same thing. OK, you know, we were energy sufficient and, um, you know, I was on TV two summers ago and I made the comment to the anchor 
that the Federal Reserve, it was actually on Fox, and I'm not partisan one way or the other, I'm bipartisan, but uh, I was on Fox and I made the comment that the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas had surveyed 400 institutions and only one out of 400 said they were willing to invest in new oil and gas development. That was a function of ESG, in my opinion, and the green progressives. And I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer in renewables. I, I think they're terrific. I'm a believer in nuclear because I think that's ultimately the cleanest fuel and the most reliable fuel source we can have. But when oil and gas is so demonized that, you know, nobody wants to touch it with a barge pole, you know, maybe we should be an investor. And so here I am running a growth fund, primarily focused on technology-enabled, technology-driven businesses and consumer businesses of very high quality. And we actually bought into a drilling rig company, which is up more than 100% since we bought into it. And, uh, and we bought into Occidental Petroleum uh, about the same time, actually, that Warren Buffett did. So, you know, do I, do, I, do I believe that fossil fuels are going to be incrementally replaced by other fuels? Yes, I think it's going to take decades. And yeah. and I think um, and I think our policies right now are inflationary, and they don't need to be. So, but Fred, uh, you know, we have we had the stimulus, but that's kind of at an end. Yes. And even the student loans are probably going to have to start make, as soon as we'll have to make payment. Right. Um, so, what, where do you see the infl- and energy? You know, has come down. Right. Uh, I think the. the Price of oil is probably no higher than it was when Putin started the war. At this at this point, there have been an you know supply responses, and grain prices are lower than they were probably the same as they were at the start of that war, of the war. So, where do you see? Um, you know, it's clear that the U.S. fiscal policy is totally out of control. <laughs> yes. Long term, we need a you know if we want to. For my calculations, just based on Congressional Budget Office projections and uh, simple, you know, present value calculations, you need about a 47% permanent, immediate and permanent increase in every single federal tax revenue source through time, because we're short about 7.7% of GDP forever. Uh, you can, if you get it through, our, through extra taxes, that's like an almost a 50% tax hike. If you get it from Cutting spending, apart from interest, it's about a 33% spending, immediate and permanent spending cut. And if you wait, these adjustments get bigger. They don't get smaller because you're, you know, you've got, you're letting more and more people off the hook from paying this gap, paying this bill. And that's, so that's uh, an analysis that puts everything on the books, doesn't just look at official debt, which ignores Social Security's 61 trillion dollar unfunded liability, for example. But, but, but Larry, those adjustments you're talking about are in real terms, correct? So if you have 3% inflation or 4% inflation for the next five years, that is actually beneficial to the government, right? In terms of their uh, ability uh, you know, to, to manage these, these obligations. Am I right in saying that? Well, yes and no. I mean, there's certain obligations like the, the federal debt itself um, uh, is nominal, right? Um, right most right. of it, there's, apart from tips, uh, which is a small component of it, right. almost all of it's nominal. So when prices go up by, let's say 10% as they have over the last 15 months or so, um, then you have uh, uh, the real value of the debt being watered down. And this is re- one reason why Debt to GDP has been coming down under the Biden administration. We've right. been uh, kind of washing it away, watering it down through inflation. So the government's been making money by making money, but this fiscal gap is primarily coming from things like Social Security, def- future dis- defense spending, welfare benefits, Medicare, healthcare benefits, federal, and all that stuff is real in the sense you you can't. Uh, inflate away doctor salaries. You have to keep doctor salaries. Right. That's right. Medicare. So the Medicare costs are going to be mm-hmm. going up with inflation. Everything and social security benefits are indexed. Now you there is some value the government, you know, is indexing social security benefits, but it's doing it with a lag of 15 months. So 
everybody's social security benefits were cut by about about seven percent last year in real terms. Uh, no, sorry, about four percent in real terms, given the the lag. But you're right; we can't inflate our way. I don't think we can inflate inflate our way out of this long term problem unless we have hyperinflation. Uh, even there, you know, defense spending is you know, those prices are going to go up. But so, what would hyperinflation do? It would uh, produce very high taxes on asset income because that's not indexed. Uh, right. The tax code right. is not indexed for right. asset income. Uh, uh, By the way, and so even relatively high levels of inflation actually help the government with its deficit, right? right. Okay, but so you know, I, I grant you this that uh, that the temptation of a government of any government that's totally broke like ours is just the first thing <laughs> to do is to print money, and and then. Prices go up, and then at some point they realize they can't get that much out of that source, so they have to do something for real. Mm -hmm. And you know the Wey the Weimar inflation, the German hyperinflation, uh, ended when uh, when the, the parties, the political parties, got together and said we're going to have a fiscal reform, and the uh, the economy, uh, the general public took that to be meaningful. And actually, prices started to, the inflation rate started to come down in Germany, even though the printing of money actually accelerated. Right. So it's interesting how expectations matter to the, what's called the velocity of money, how much it turned yes. over, the effective amount of money. But anyway, uh, so I'm, I'm with you that uh, we have a long-term problem, that there is an incentive to print money. But let me ask you, is there anything else that you're seeing about inflation that um, is a cause for concern, you know, that people are not talking about that you're looking at? Well, let's talk about this whole issue of reshoring, bringing back to the United States critical industries or, or, or you know, in the extreme, people say, oh, all industry, we should do all our own manufacturing. That is ridiculous. That makes no sense at all. It's incredibly inefficient. You as an economist know that better than I do. Um, but having said that, even bringing back certain industries and critical though they might be will be somewhat inflationary. I mean, I think it's, it's true. And so, oh, look, I mean, as much as you can say our government's broken, it was, it's, you know, it's music to my ears to you say that on the one hand, on the other hand, I don't think we're as bad as, I mean, Europe's in much worse position than we are, I think uh, fundamentally. And China's not in a great position at all. I mean, their demographics are not at all good. Uh, Japan's demographics aren't particularly good. So, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, I think inflation, um, I mean, first, we can live with it. I mean, the difference between 2% inflation and 3 or 4% inflation doesn't affect most people who are wealthy. But it affects, it affects the lower class a lot. And that's the most worrisome part of this, in my view. My, my, my biggest concern about this country is class warfare. And that's been brewing and has been fueled for the last four or five years. I think it's driving our political conversations. Uh, I'm very worried about the next election. I'm very worried about it. Uh, what are you worried about? What, what exactly? <laughs> what do you see? What do you, what's your worst case scenario here? Well, I'm worried that I, I I'm worried that Joe Biden has got a red carpet to the another four years. I think it's I think it's almost this is this may sound crazy. He's got a low approval rating. A lot of people think he's not capable, but the Republican Party is going to screw this thing up. They're not going to be able to compete. I mean, what are you worried about with? Uh, you know, I agree. Biden is not taking the stance. You know, steps that I would take to. Uh, Right. You know, form fundamental reform, social security, health care, uh, or try to, or at least articulate a brand new vision of the tax system uh, so that we can get this, this problem under control. Uh, but he's done a lot of other things, which I would approve of. Um, what are you concerned about mostly with, uh, with brought Biden? Well, no, I, I mean, well, first I'm, I'm worried. I'm worried about his foreign policy. I mean, I think he's going to, Europe and standing next to Zelensky 
and saying, you know, Russia will never take over. That's fairly inflammatory stuff. Now, one great way for a president to get reelected is to be involved in a war. And I'm not saying that cynically. That's just historically fact tells you that. But I will also tell you, I mean, it, I, I'm making a different comment here, which is, you know, I think there's a lot of a lot of us who are right leaning. I'm really centrist. My wife is quite right leaning. I'm quite centrist. But my view is that if Trump runs again, whether or not he gets the nomination as a Republican or doesn't, he could run as an independent. He's going to then he's absolutely assuring that Biden will get reelected. It'll be a Ross Perot situation. Okay, the so, independence so Biden's will, reelected. Why is that a problem from your point? It may not be. By the way, it may not be. It may not be a problem except for the issue of capability. The issue of is he able to do the job? Because and if he's age, not able to do the age. job, pardon me? Because of his age. No, not no, not because of his age, but because of his health. I mean, there's a big difference. You know, uh, one of my mentors growing up and along the way here was the former chairman of Kidder Peabody, who died at 107. And at 93, 94, he was as sharp as you and I. I mean, he was unbelievably sharp. So I don't think it's a function of age. I think it's a function. And, and he had high energy as well. I think it's a function of health. And I think then the problem becomes who's really running the government. And that's worrisome to me. That that worries me. I mean, you know, Kamala Harris seems to be largely invisible or worse. And then the question is, who's really running the government? And that's that's worrisome to me. I see. OK, well, uh, that's a reasonable concern, I think, uh, President's health. Um, what about your views on the recessions? Let's uh, kind of wind it up with um, yeah. uh, a couple minutes on that issue. Well, I, I don't, uh, you know, technically speaking, because unemployment I don't think, as a traditional economist, I think you'd agree with me, unemployment is not a required aspect of, of a recession. A recession is, what, two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth? Isn't that it? Right. We, well, had, we, had, that, we had that last year. In the, we in had the, that and we denied that we were in a recession, right? <laughs> yeah, it's not a, you know, a set right. formula. Uh, the economists at the National Bureau of Economic Research have well, I, Right. I don't know. Um I think I, I don't happen to think if if I think we're going to be in a slower period of growth. I mean, it, it is interesting watching people pull back, be more cautious. You know, when you go to the supermarket and my wife jokes about when she used to go to the supermarket, every item was a dollar. Now every item's four dollars. Now she's going way back when every item was a dollar in her head, she said. But, you know, when you go to the supermarket, or you go out to out to dinner or something like that. And you're, you know, you're spending how much money for a piece of fish? How much money for a piece of chicken? How much money for a box of cereal? How much money for a dozen eggs? It's, it's it, that that's bothersome. Gasoline prices have come down. They're still high, but they're they're fine. Um, but you know, you look at service costs, very high. I don't see any. I don't see how those are going to come down. We are very much a service economy, and. Um, and energy costs, I think, are going to basically, I, I don't think they're coming down. I'll put it that way. I just don't think. And if we have a strong economy, we're certainly not coming down. So, you know, I think I think, um, I think, think all of that set. And so when I, and you have an inflationary environment, people are going to be more careful about their spending. So I think we'll have, I don't even want to call it a soft landing. I think we'll have kind of a, a stagnant economy. And we'll have inflation. So I guess that you put those two together and you come up with that ugly word stagflation. I think that's kind of what where we are right now. And that says to me that there are going to be opportunities if the because the market has sold, sold off and is selling off at times. It's a very volatile market. There are going to be good opportunities in specific holdings. I think indexes will do less well because it'll be more of a diversified um a diversified holding. But I want to get back to something you said, Larry, because it was brilliant, actually. And I, I want to I want to put an exclamation point next to it. Too many people look at investing and they look at a point in time. And if you look at any of you who are listening, if you go to Google and you do a Google chart of the S&P 500 for the last year, three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you'll see that the shorter the period, the more jagged the lines are. It looks very volatile. It's very scary. But if you look at it over the longer sweep of time, 
I think you'll find it to be, you know, fairly modest. It's a fairly straight line up and to the right. And, and that's a function of technology growth and creativity. And this country remains pretty darn good at that. So as, as long-term investors, you know, I mean, I, as a long-term investor, I'm, I'm fine. I mean, I tell everybody just stay the course, stay the course, stay the course. Because, but if you have a three or five year perspective or a two year perspective, I mean, I'd frankly put money, you can put money into a money, into a money market now and make almost 4%. Yeah. Uh, but I want to add one other thing, just to be clear to people who are listening to this. And that is that my money, as it relates to my public equity holdings, is invested exactly the same way my client's money is. Like, I don't have my, I don't have this portfolio of, oh, that's good for me, but it's not good for them. No, my money is pretty much invested exactly as theirs is. In fact, not pretty much, it is invested. And so when somebody comes in, like Larry has the same holdings. I, I'm sorry, Larry is a client. So any client of mine has the same holdings I do. So when new money comes in, they invest you in those holdings. There are times where we're hold off on a specific holding because we think it's overpriced and we think we may actually end up being sellers of that holding. So we don't want to get our clients in that. But if you take a longer period of time for us to put the money work three, four, five months. At the end of that period, the holdings pretty much are all the same across the portfolio. So they're separately managed accounts. So everybody's cost basis is different. It does enable us to do some tax optimization, so-called tax harvesting at year end. So we can wipe out capital gains with capital losses. Although hopefully we'll have long periods of time where we have no capital losses, so we can't wipe out the gains. That's a good problem to have, believe it or not. Yeah, right. uh, but, uh, you know, what What we see, what we invest in is is, is the same for everybody. It's, it's what I invest in. And I want to add one other thing, and this was, I think it's been implicit in this conversation, but I invest with a, when I look at companies to invest in, I'm not interested in the rumors or this is a hot company or anything like that. Um, I mean, you know, I do the same work I would as I would with a private company. So as I sometimes jokingly say to people, I'm now in the investment management business, managing a public portfolio. Put differently, I'm now eating what I, I'm now, um, you know, I'm now e consuming what I used to produce because I used to take these companies public and I do mergers and I finance them privately and then we take them public. Now I'm investing in those companies. So, you know, Alta was a private holding uh, Dick Sporting Goods. I was an investor in Dick Sporting Goods before I went public. I mean, it's it's a it's a I think it's pretty pretty expensive now. Six months ago, it was a bargain. Um, so you know, there there are there's a time and a place and for each of these companies, and you can still make good money in the public equity markets. You really can. And uh, and when you look at the returns in venture capital, the dispersion returns is enormous. In growth equity, which is more mature private companies. The dispersion of returns is still pretty high in the public market. The dispersion of returns by holding may be high, but the, but overall the market, the market returns will be you know they'll be what they are. They can be over a period of time, as Larry referenced, they've been nine and a half percent total return, which is pretty good. I mean, maybe in private equity you can make fifteen, or maybe you make ten, or maybe you make eight, and in, and in venture capital you can make large amounts of money, and you can also make no return on capital. It, it happens. Yeah. So, uh, Fred, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. And uh, I think people learned a lot about, uh, you know, your world and uh, and also got some insight about their own investing. And uh, we will be in touch. Great to have you. Thanks, thank man. you. Thank you, Larry. I've been so long winded. I hope people have the, the little button on their playback so they can accelerate the speed. I apologize for how lengthy, oh. but it's a lot of fun, Larry. I love, as you know, we have our telephone conversations. They're a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. we're always talking. Okay, you take care. And I'll see, and I'll see you later this spring.